Programming the camera for your game is no simple task. For a strategy game in particular, the camera's movement is one of the main ways that players interact with your game. Now, while there are endless tweaks and adjustments that can be made to dial in the feel of your game's camera, in this video, I want to build up the basic mechanics of a camera for a strategy game while creating enough settings that you can tune the camera to feel good and fit the needs of your game. And we're going to do all of that with Unity's new input system. Our camera will have smooth horizontal motion, the ability to rotate and zoom. In addition, we'll also add in the ability to move the camera by moving the mouse to the edge of the screen. And finally, we'll create the ability to click and drag the world, giving the player one more way to move around the world that you've created. So the first thing we need to do in our video is create our camera rig. And the way this is going to work is we're going to have two objects with an optional third object. The first object is going to be the rig base, and that's going to move around the horizontal plane as well as rotate uh, to get different angles from our camera. The second object is going to be a camera object. It's going to be the child object, and that's going to be able to move up and down uh, relative to that parent object, letting us have that effect of zooming in and out and uh, seeing more of or less of the world. So to do this here in Unity, I'm going to create a new empty object. I'm going to call this camera rig base, like so. And then just to keep things nice and simple, I'm going to make sure we're at 0, 0, 0, like so. And then I'm going to add in a camera as a child object like that. And I'm going to go get a top down view and I'm going to pull my camera back on the X axis. You can see its position there is around negative or so I guess I'm pulling back on the Z axis. Uh, my position there is roughly negative eight and a half. I'm going to get a side view and do the same and lift it up about eight or so on the Y axis. Now this positioning works well for the world and the scale that I've built. You're going to need to play around with this depending on the scale of your world and exactly what you want your player to see. This is worth some taking some time to do this. The third optional object is going to be just a primitive shape. In this case, I'm going to add in a sphere and I'm going to make sure this is at zero, zero, zero. What that's going to do is just provide a little bit of visual feedback as to where this base object is. If something goes wrong with your code, this is a nice way to kind of debug what's happening because you can actually see something moving around on the scene. That's not just the camera. So our next step is to create the input action asset. Now, if you're new to Unity's input system, I'd recommend you check out my earlier video on the input system. This video, we'll talk a little bit about how it works, but we're not going to go into the same depth that I did in that earlier video. So here in the input settings folder, I'm going to right click, create and come down here to input actions. And I'm going to call this camera control actions. Like so. And then I'm going to press enter one more time to open it up like so. Then what we need to do is create a action map and I'm going to call this camera. Let's move that out of the way. Camera. We're just going to call it camera. Now, something that can come up here, I've called the input action asset camera control actions. If I was to name this action map camera control uh, unit, when I generate the C sharp class, Unity will throw an error. It'll get grumpy at it because it does some automatic name creation in the C sharp generation. So just make sure that your action map and your input action asset don't share the same first part of their name. Once we do that, the first thing we're going to do is uh, come here to this action and I'm going to create a movement action. So the next thing we need to do is add in our composite binding. That's going to allow us to have our WASD or our arrow keys all combining into this one action. Now to do that, we generally right click here on the binding itself or rather the action. And there's a composite binding option here. Now, I don't know if this is because I've updated the input system or updated Unity. The composite binding is no longer there. What we need to do is come over here to the action type, choose a value, control type, and then a vector two, and then come back to our action and right click. And there is our up, down, left, right composite. Now, I don't know if that's my mistake or something changed. That's the way I did it. I'm going to delete this old binding since we don't need it. I'm then going to go through the process of binding my WASD keys. And again, if you don't know how to do this, check out my earlier video. So now that we've got our uh, movement action settled, I'm going to add in two more actions. This one's going to be rotate camera. And while I'm at it, I'm going to add in the next one. And this is going to be zoom camera like so. Then coming back up to my rotate camera, I'm going to change this action from a button to a value. And this is also going to be a vector two. I'm going to come back to my binding, choose the path and go to mouse. And what we're looking for is delta here. And the reason we want delta and not the raw mouse position is because as we move the mouse position, 
the change in that position is what we want as our input. The change in the mouse position, not the actual value of the mouse position, is going to control our rotation. We're going to come down here to our zoom camera. We're also going to change this to value and a vector two. Then on the binding, I'm going to come to the path and we want the scroll. So mouse scroll. And that's going to enable us to use that mouse scroll wheel back and forth to zoom up and down or in or out uh, with our camera. So the next thing we need to do is make sure we've got auto save clicked. And then with the input action asset selected here in the project folders, so we can see in the inspector, I'm going to toggle generate C sharp class on and press apply. So with our rig built and our input action assets sorted, now it's time to get down to the code. So I'm going to come here to my scripts folder. I'm going to add in a new C sharp script. I'm going to call this camera control. Let's call it camera controller. Then going to open it up in Visual Studio like so. Now to make use of our new input system, we're going to need to add in a new namespace, which is unity engine.input system like so. So this camera controller is going to have that horizontal motion, rotational motion, zooming motion. We're going to be able to move the mouse to the edge of the screen and move the camera. We're also going to be able to drag the world around. And to create all that functionality, we need a lot of variables. And frankly, it's kind of a poop ton of variables. So I'm going to copy that off of my example script, paste that in here, and then we'll go through it in big uh, chunks and talk about what those big chunks do. When we implement those variables, I think they will become more obvious as what they do. So what we've got up here at the top, our first two variables have to do with our input system. First one is the camera control actions or the input action asset that we just created. The second one is our movement input action. Now we're caching that because we're going to be pulling that input action every frame to be as responsive as we can rather than relying on events. That way, if a player holds down W, we know that they're holding it down and it's just a little bit simpler, in my opinion, a little bit cleaner than trying to do it all with events. Down below that, the next chunk has to do with horizontal motion. We have max speed, current speed, and then we have two variables that are, have to do with acceleration. So we have nice smooth ramping up of our speed up to that max value and then ramping back down to zero, again, creating a nice smooth motion. Down below that has to do with vertical motion or our zoom. So we've got our step size, which is basically how much the camera moves every time the scroll wheel clicks. If you have continuously scrolling scroll wheel, still works. We got zoom damping, same idea, creating that nice smooth motion. We're going to use that in a lerp function. Then we have min and max height, which is pretty much what it sounds like. It's going to control how low or how high the camera can go so we don't lose track of the world. And finally, just a general zoom speed, again, helping us control how quickly we're moving from where we currently are to our next position. Then down below that, we've got our max rotation speed, which is pretty self-explanatory. Our base object is going to rotate. This controls how fast that happens. Then we have our screen edge motion. Now, this is a little bit less clear. So the way this works is we're watching to see when the cursor is at a certain position on the screen. And we want to do that as a percentage of screen so that if we play our game on different resolutions, it still behaves the same. I have my edge tolerance uh, set to 5%. So when my cursor is on the left 5% or the top 5%, then this motion is going to occur. But I wanted to make it a variable that we could tune that. You might want to make it more, you might want to make it less. The next variable here is mostly for using this in Unity. While I quite like being able to move my mouse and have the world or the camera move around when I do that, it's a little difficult to do with Unity. So if you're in play mode and you move your mouse over to the inspector to make some adjustments, the camera's going to move. It's going to move because the cursor's off the screen. So I added a Boolean there to be able to toggle this on and off, which I find pretty useful when in Unity. Our last uh, five variables here, these are all internal local variables that do not get set in the inspector. These are primarily used because we have one function that's taking in the input and is going to set a target value and then another function, that function is often called from the update function, is going to make use of that value. And so these variables are just a way of tracking those values um, as the code executes. All right, so that's, like I said, a lot, a lot of variables. Now we want to create some actual functionality. The first one we're going to create is that horizontal motion, and it's going to take a fair amount of work. It takes more work than the other motions. First thing we're going to do is create a awake function to initialize our input system. So we're going to have camera actions equals new camera actions or camera control actions like so. And then we want to grab a reference to our camera transform. So camera transform equals this dot get component in children camera 
like so. Oh, and I guess we need to transform. We're not actually getting the camera component, we're getting the transform there. Now, yes, you could have this as a serialized variable and drag and drop the camera into that slot in the inspector, and that works, but I just know I will forget to do that, and I try to have as little of that as possible. I'm not too worried about having to get that component on the awake function. Next, in the on enable function, we're going to set our last position equal to this transform.position. And this is one of those variables that we're setting in one function and using another. This is going to be used to track the current velocity of the camera object. So we're, every frame, we're gonna store the position as last position. Then we're going to look at the current position and get our velocity vector and speed that way. So on enable, we're just making sure that this is up to date before we do anything else. Then we're gonna do movement equals camera actions. So that's the input action asset. Then we're gonna use the camera action map and we're gonna grab our movement uh, action like so. Again, catching that so that we can pull it every frame. Last thing we need to do, we're gonna do camera actions, camera enable like so to make sure that that action map is enabled and we'll be able to get uh, events and or just any input from actions in that action map. Then we're gonna go to on disable here. Uh, what I'm gonna do is camera actions and we're going to go disable like so. And that just means, so for some reason, if this object gets turned off, we're also turning off the action map so we don't get any unwanted events or anything errors popping up like that. Just keep things nice and tidy. If you don't do that, you might get away with it but you might find an edge case where it's important. All right, so now we're gonna create a bunch of new functions here. Our first one is gonna be our update, update velocity, like so. And this here, we're gonna get our horizontal velocity, and this is going to be this transform position minus last position divided by time delta time. So what I'm doing here is, again, I'm getting the uh, current position, subtracting the last position, and then dividing by time delta time, which is the time of the last frame. So for those of you guys who have taken high school physics, what I've got here is the displacement divided by the time. Since it's a horizontal velocity, I'm then gonna set the Y component to zero because our camera is just going to be moving in this horizontal plane. If there was any uh, vertical velocity, I wanna get rid of that right now. And then we're gonna set last position, this transform position like so. So after we've calculated the velocity, we're gonna update that last position for the next frame, the next time that we call this function. All right, next, we're gonna create our get keyboard movement. So this is where we're actually going to be pulling that movement action and translating that into um, a target position for the camera object to move to. So I'm gonna create a vector three, and I'm gonna call this input value. And that's going to equal our movement action. And we're going to read the value from that. That is a vector two. And I just want to get the X component of that. And we're gonna multiply that by the output of a function we're gonna create here in just a minute. Get camera right. I'll explain what I'm doing here. I'm gonna come down a line and we're going to add that to movement, read value, vector two. And we're gonna get just the Y value of that. And we're gonna multiply that by get camera forward. So what we're doing here is we want our movement to be relative to the camera's direction. When I press W, I don't always wanna move in the positive Z direction. Or when I push A, I don't always wanna move in the negative X direction. It wants, we want it to be relative to the camera so it's easier to control and a whole lot more intuitive. And that's what our get camera right and get camera forward functions will do. They're gonna reference our camera object and return the relative left or relative right and forward directions for that camera. But before we create those functions, I'm gonna finish this function out. So next thing I'm gonna do is I'm gonna take that input value and we are going to normalize it what normalizing does is make the vector of length one, which is gonna make our input more consistent. That way, if you press W and D at the same time, we don't actually go faster than if you were just pressing W, we would just be going in a different direction. Then we're gonna say input value, square magnitude greater than 0.1. 
And the reason we're doing that, we want to make sure that our input value is we're actually reading something off that input value. Probably not 100% necessary, um, but I'm doing it anyways. And we're going to say our target position plus equals input value. Now, our target position is where we're trying to move to. So rather than setting the actual position here in this function, we're updating or adding to our target position. So in the update function, we can lerp towards that target position. It's going to create nice smooth motion. It also means that we can have multiple of functions adding to this uh, target position, keeping things smooth and just working pretty well. So let's get rid of those errors and create our get camera right and get camera forward functions. This is going to return a vector three. And what we want to do here is first create that vector. And that's going to be camera transform dot right, which is going to get the right direction from the camera, regardless of where the camera is facing. This is the vector that's pointing to the right of the camera. We're then going to take the Y value and squash that down to zero, just like we did before and return right, just like so. And again, the reason we are squashing that Y value to zero is because we want to keep our motion in that horizontal plane. I'm going to copy this function and I'm going to rename it to get camera forward. I'm going to rename the variable forward, spell it correctly. And importantly, more importantly than renaming the variable, is here I want to change camera transform dot right to camera dot forward like so. So we have one more function that we need to create this horizontal motion, and that's actually going to move the camera. So come down here. So I'm going to create one more function. It's going to return void, and I'm going to call this update base position like so. So what I'm first going to do here is check to see if my target position square magnitude is greater than 0.1 f. So what we're trying to do here is see if the target position has been set. What that means, if we are doing that, we want to be ramping up our speed towards that maximum speed and moving towards that position. If the target position is zero, uh, which we're going to reset it to zero at the end of this function, we want to have our speed ramp back down to zero again, creating that nice smooth uh, motion. So inside here, we're going to set our speed to math f lerp and here we're going to go from the current value of speed to max speed and we're going to do that time delta time times acceleration again that's where that acceleration is coming in is controlling how we are ramping our speed up to that maximum speed we're then going to update our transform position value so i'm going to do plus equals target position times speed times time delta time. If the target position is zero, then we want to be slowing back down. And this is where we're going to make use of that horizontal velocity that we calculated earlier. So here we're going to say horizontal velocity equals vector three lerp from the current value of horizontal velocity to vector three zero, because we're trying to slow our horizontal velocity. And we're going to do that time delta time times our damping variable like so. And again, our damping variable, I've separated it from the acceleration variable, which was used to speed up. Here, the damping variable is going to control how quickly we slow back down to zero. Then we're going to update our position, the plus equals horizontal velocity times time delta time, like so. And our last step, just to make sure this all works, we're going to set our target position to vector three, zero, which again is if we don't do this, our if statement is not going to work because our target position will remain whatever it was before. All right, so that is a lot of work so far. We still don't have any functionality. So we're going to come back here to our code and add in that functionality. For my own organization, I'm going to add in a update function, update function below the on disable. And here we need to call the functions that we just created. So first thing we're going to do is get keyboard movement like so. So we get the input. We're then going to update the velocity and then update the base position like so. All right. So let's go back in here into Unity and see if this works. We'll go into play mode. There we go. 
So you can see my world was created below me and I'm using the WASD keys and I can move around. Now you'll notice that I'm not looking in the correct direction. I haven't told my camera to look at the base object yet. We'll do that later when we're adding the zoom functionality. If this is the only functionality that you want in your on enable or awake function, you can have a camera transform look at the base object. That's all we're going to do later on. We're just going to be updating it every frame because we're going to be zooming up and down. But if you don't want that functionality, you can put it just about anywhere in your code. So with the horizontal motion working, next thing I want to be able to do is rotate the camera around that base object. To do that, we're going to make use of those C-sharp events. We're also going to write an additional function to rotate that base object. And comparing to creating this horizontal motion, it's much simpler and much quicker. So here in the on enable function, what I want to do is subscribe to the performed event of that rotate action. So I'm going to do camera actions. That's the input action. I'm going to go to the camera action map. And then I want the rotate camera action. And then I want performed. And I'm going to subscribe rotate camera. It's a function we're going to create here in just a little bit. I'm then also going to copy that entire line, bring it down to the on disable function and change that plus from a minus so that we unsubscribe from that event. Again, you might be able to test this and it works without it, but it's a good practice. And in some testing, I've definitely run into some errors when I've forgotten to do that. Now let's create that rotate camera function. I'm going to do that by right clicking and having Visual Studio do it for me. So I'm going to create that. I'm going to copy that. And I'm going to pull this down here to the bottom of our class like so. Now, the reason I have Visual Studio create this function for me is to make sure that I have the input parameter of the correct type and it all matches and it's just easier to do. I'm going to change the name of the input to input value like so. And then we're going to get rid of this. So the way I want to implement this rotation is when I press the middle mouse button and then move the mouse, the camera is going to rotate. It'd be pretty frustrating if every time you move the mouse, the uh, camera rotated. So to check and make sure that our middle mouse button is pressed, I'm going to add in an if statement and it's going to be negate the mouse dot current middle mouse button is pressed. And what this is going to do is check and see if that middle mouse button is pressed. Doesn't care if it was pressed this frame or not. And if that middle mouse button is not pressed, we're going to return and not do any of the following code. And I'm going to create a new float value like so. And this is going to be input value. We're going to read the value of it, vector two. It is a vector two, but I only want the X component of it. We're just using the X position because I'm going to rotate around the Y axis. I'm not rotating in all directions just to keep it a lot simpler. With that value collected, we're then going to set the rotation of our transform to quaternion Euler 0F. So zero in the X direction. We're going to take our value multiply it by our max rotation speed, add that to our transforms current rotation in Euler angles, Y, and then the Z value is going to be zero as well. So again, what we're doing here is we're taking our current Euler uh, rotation in the Y direction, adding into it this input of value so that we can change our rotation. If you forget the current value, you get some really weird snapping behavior. It's not nice. Saving that, going back into Unity. There's our world. We can still move. And if I use my mouse scroll wheel, if I press my middle mouse button and rotate the mouse, I can see the world turning around me. Okay, so we've got horizontal motion. We've got rotation. The next thing I want to create is that zoom effect so we can go up and down. And for a lot of people, those three motions are going to make a pretty satisfactory, at least prototype, a strategy camera. So let's head back to our code and see how we do this. Our zoom motion is again going to take advantage of our C sharp events. So here on our on enable and on disable, we're going to subscribe and unsubscribe from the performed event. So we're going to go camera actions, camera action map. In this case, it's going to be the zoom camera action performed. Just like before, we're going to name a function here. It's going to throw an error and we'll create that function in a bit. I'm going to copy and paste that down and unsubscribe and have Visual Studio create that function for me again. Copy it down to the bottom. Once again, I'm going to rename this input value like so. Our squirrel wheel input is coming in as a vector two, 
But in my case, I only want the Y value, so the normal scroll wheel use. So I'm going to create a new float called value. And this is going to be the negative value of the input value. We're going to read the value of vector two, like so, and we're going to get the Y value. And for my tuning purposes, I'm dividing that by 100. I want this to be a fairly small input. You can play around with this number. I didn't create it, uh, I didn't set it as a variable that you can edit in the inspector. This worked pretty well. We're gonna have other values that you can tune that have a similar or same effect. This value can be both positive and negative. Positive, we're gonna go up, negative, we're gonna go down, or vice versa. And we wanna check and see if this value is not zero. And since it's a float, we don't wanna compare it directly to zero. Instead, what I'm gonna do is take the absolute value of this and compare that to a small value. So if math absolute value of this value is greater than 0.1 F, we're going to do some stuff. I'm going to set my zoom height. So this is where we're trying to get to. This is the, uh, the height that we want that camera object to be at. We're going to set this equal to camera transform local position. Really important that it's local. We want the Y value of that. And we're going to add that to our value times our step size. And that's where our step size variable is controlling how much we're going to be moving up and down. Now this would work just fine if we didn't have that min and max height that we want to be able to set. This is the zoom height of where we might go to. And we want to check and make sure that is between our min and maximum height. So to do that, I'm going to check if my zoom height is less than min height. If it is, I'm going to set my zoom height to that minimum height. And similarly, if the zoom height is greater than max height, we're going to set our zoom height to our max height. And again, that just brackets us, prevents us from going too low or too high. Now, inside this function, we're not actually going to move the camera. And the reason we're not going to do that is this function is getting called when that event occurs, when the scroll wheel uh, value changed. That would create zoom motion, but it wouldn't be smooth. To make that smooth, we're going to have a second function that's actually moving this camera. It's going to get called every frame from the update function, and we're going to take advantage of a lerp to make it nice and smooth. So let's create another new function, and this is going to be update camera position, like so. In here, we're going to create a vector three, and this is our zoom target, and this is where we're trying to get our camera to go to. This is going to be a new vector three, and it's going to be camera transform local position. Again, we're doing all of this in local. If you don't do this in local, at least when I was testing, I had some pretty weird behavior. Uh, the Y value is going to be the zoom height that we set in our previous function and local position Z like so. Now, full disclosure, the next line that I'm going to write, there's probably better ways to do this. What I want to create here is when I zoom, I don't just want to go up and down. When I go up and down, I also want to go away from this base object. Chronic, and that's what creates that real zoom behavior. It feels more natural when we, I add this in. If you don't like it, you don't need to do it. But the code that I use to create it, it's not the most intuitive. It's probably not the most clever, but it does work. So what we're going to do here is zoom target. And I'm going to update this. We're going to minus equals zoom speed times all the quantity here. I warned you, it's a little messy. The zoom height minus the camera transform local position Y. And we're going to multiply this by the vector three forward. So what we're doing here is basically we're looking at, hey, where is the camera currently located in the Y? Where is it trying to get to? So that gives us a value of how much we're trying to move. We're going to multiply that by our zoom speed. And then our forward vector is going to allow us to move the camera forwards or backwards, depending on how much we're trying to move vertically. Hope that makes sense. It may not, but it does work. Then what we're going to do is we're going to take our camera transform local position and set that equal to vector three lerp. Camera transform local position. So it's current position. And we're going to lerp that towards the zoom target. We're going to do that with time delta time and multiply that by zoom dampening. So again, that's where our zoom dampening variable comes in and controlling 
how quickly that lerp happens, um, basically how smooth that's going to be. Last thing we're going to do is camera transform look at, and we're going to look at this transform object. So what that's going to do, the camera transform, which is again, remember, is just the camera object, the child of the object that this code is on. We're going to have a look at this base object. That way, when we zoom, uh, when we move up, we move out, we're constantly looking at the correct position. So our zoom camera function is getting called when the uh, event is invoked, but this update camera position, we need to add that to our update function. So let's scroll up here to our update function, and we're going to add this in here, update camera position, head back into Unity and into play mode. So you can see we've got a little bit of weirdness going on there. We're going to fix that here in just a minute. But as I move my scroll wheel, we can move in and out. I can use my uh, middle mouse button click and move my mouse. I can rotate. I can also use my WASD keys. And now that we're actually aiming or looking at the base object, you can see the sphere and how that's giving us some feedback as to what's going on. So let's go fix that weirdness. If you didn't notice that when we first looked at it, we were kind of in the wrong position. It felt a little weird. It's not great. The way we're going to fix that is by giving some of our variables an initial value. So here on enable, I'm going to set my zoom height to the camera transform local position in the Y. And if we don't do that, our zoom height is set to zero, which is why we were kind of squashed down below. We're also going to have our camera transform look at this transform like so, just like we did in that update camera position. But the reason we want to call this on our on enable is we want the camera to look at that base object from the very start, not after the player has used their zoom wheel. Let's save that, go back into Unity. So going here into play mode, you can see here now that we're looking in the correct direction. I don't have to use my scroll wheel to do that. And all of our functionality is still in place. So for a lot of folks, that horizontal motion, rotation, and zooming, it's going to be good enough for your prototype or your game uh, as is. But we can go a little bit further if you so desire. We're going to next implement the ability to move the mouse cursor to the edges of the screen and then have the camera move in the correct direction relative to which way we push the mouse. So no surprise, to do this, we're going to add in a, another function. And this is going to be check mouse at screen edge. And here we need to create a couple variables. So we're going to create a vector two, which is the mouse position. And using the new input system, we can still get directly the mouse position. We do that with mouse.current.position. And we're going to read the value like so. We also want a move direction. This is the direction we're actually going to move the camera in. And we're just going to initiate this or initialize that to uh, the vector 3.0. So with these two variables created, we now need to check where the mouse cursor is, if it's on the edges. So I'm going to say mouse position dot X. If that is less than the edge tolerance, and remember our edge tolerance is our percentage of our screen that's going to trigger this. Mine set at 5%. And I'm going to multiply that by screen width. And we're using screen width here again, so we can have multiple resolutions and it's still going to work. If that's true, we're going to say a move direction plus equals get camera right, or rather the negative get camera right. Else if move, posi um, move posi or else if mouse position, little brain fart there, X is greater than one minus the edge tolerance times a screen width. So in this case, with my 5%, that means we're more than 95% of the screen over. If that's true, we're going to set move direction to get camera right like so. And then we're going to repeat the process for the vertical. So that's going to be if mouse position Y less than edge tolerance times screen height in this case, we're going to say move direction plus equals negative get camera forward. Else if mouse position y greater than one f minus edge tolerance times our screen height. And if that's true, 
we're going to update our mouse direction with get camera forward. So the reason I'm updating rather than just setting the value of this move direction is so that if the mouse cursor is moved into a corner of the screen, we'll be able to move at a diagonal. With that done, we're going to update our target position with this move direction. So again, we're going to take advantage of the fact that we're already setting this target position with our keyboard input. We're just going to add additional input from the mouse. So what this does mean that if I press say W and move my mouse to the top of the screen, I will move twice as fast because I'm getting uh, contributions both from the keyboard and from the mouse to this target position. So what we need to do then is come back up to our update function and add this new function into our update function like so. Go back into Unity and into play mode and test this out, see how well this works. So there we go. If I move my mouse to the top, we move left, right, bottom. Now you might be able to see what I was talking about before. Now, if I want to come over here to my inspector and change some value, my game moves and it's a little frustrating. So let's go add one more addition so we can toggle that off using our use screen Boolean. So here in the update, I'm just going to add in a check for use screen edge like so. And that's just going to allow us to toggle this on and off. Maybe you actually want to give access to that variable as well. So your players can toggle that on and off. What I want to add in next is the ability to drag the camera around using the mouse. This is something done in a lot of games. I don't think it's necessary, but it is a fun and fluid way to get around the camera much quicker than these other methods. I've taken an awful lot of this from a game dev guide video. I'll make sure to put a link down below that video. Uh, the code looks different, but a lot of the ideas came from that video. That video also made use of the old input system. So I've converted that, but I do want to give credit where due. So to create this, I'm going to create a new function and it's going to call, I'm going to call this drag camera. And here, once again, I'm going to check and see if our mouse button, in this case, our right mouse button is being pressed. If it's not, I'm going to return. Don't want to do anything else. Now, the reason I'm using my right mouse button is because I'm using my left button to interact with my UI and other bits and pieces in the game. If I use my left mouse button to drag around, I'm going to need to add some extra checks in here to see if I'm placing a unit, to see if I'm selecting a unit. It just gets a lot more complicated. The simple way around that for me was to use the right mouse button. Next, we're going to create a plane. Now, this, this was one of the pieces I picked up from that game dev guide video I thought was really clever. I'd never seen it before. And what we're doing here is creating a plane that we can rake has to. I don't need an object in my scene to rake has to. I don't have to do any fancy math with rays or this or that. Which actually, I've done before. I remember before I knew this was a thing. We're going to create a plane. Plane takes in two parameters. The first is the normal. So this is the direction, the perpendicular vector. In this case, I want it to go up because I want my plane to be aligned with that X, Z axis or X, Z plane. And then the second parameter is a point on that plane. Again, I wanted to go through the origin, so we're going to set that to vector 3.0. Next, we want to create the ray for our ray cast, and that's going to be camera.main screen point to ray mouse current position dot read value. If you did happen to see my ray casting video where I converted those examples uh, to the new input system, I forgot to do that on those examples. Thanks to a comment, I caught that and we'll make, we'll make sure that we do that correctly in this video. Last thing we need to do here is the actual raycast. So I'm going to do if here in this case, the plane itself has a raycast and we're going to provide that ray. And here we're going to create an out value. I'm going to call it distance. So what's clever here is that out value is going to tell us how far that ray traveled from the camera through the mouse to that plane, assuming it hit the plane. That distance is going to be useful to be able to find the point that we actually hit on that plane. So here our movement gets broken into two pieces. One, when we first click, we want to store that position where we started. And then later, if we're still dragging our mouse, we want to now get that position and we're going to use those two values to move our camera. So we're first going to check if our mouse button is pressed on this frame. So mouse current right button was pressed this frame. Again, pick this up in a comment from a previous video. Thank you. I had been looking for that. I couldn't find in the documentation. 
If that's true, we're going to say start start drag is equal to ray dot get point distance. So start drag was a variable we created at the beginning. It's just a local variable. It's just getting set here. We're going to store where we started our drag. The get point, what that does is it takes in that distance that the ray traveled because the ray knows where it started and the direction it went, does the math for us and tells us where that ray is actually hit that plane. If that's not true, we're going to set our target position plus equals start drag ray get point like so. Again, we're taking advantage of this target position variable that we're using in other functions. We're just updating the value with this. Last thing we need to do is add this drag camera to our update function. So scrolling back up, I'm going to add that drag camera. We're going to save that and head back into Unity and play mode and see if this works. So here you can see I can use my right mouse button and the mouse to drag the world around. It feels really good. It feels really smooth. So just a functional note on how I did that drag camera. I was making use of camera.main, which is not particularly performant, and there are other ways of getting access to that camera object. If you do do it that way, make sure that your camera is tagged main camera. I didn't have that in some of my testing and it didn't work right away. So if the dragging's not working, make sure you check that. All right, that was no small task to create that camera controller. If you made it this far into the video, I very much appreciate it. At the end of the day, I hope that was interesting and better yet useful for you and your project. And until next time, happy game designing.